So uh, welcome to this talk titled Moving Forwards with Pedagogic Research. And uh, if it was to have a subtitle, I think it would be things I've learned since moving from subject to pedagogic research. So about four and a half years ago, I moved from research purely in my discipline to a predominantly pedagogic uh, uh, approach. So what's the purpose of this talk? Well, really, it's kind of a meandering journey through some of the philosophy of social science, but clearly assuming that you have no prior knowledge, which I did when I moved from subject to pedagogic research. Um, and I guess what I want to do is make sense of what we're aiming to do with pedagogic research. Uh, what's the purpose of it? Um, and some of the objectives for this short talk will to think about or begin your journey in considering different epistemological starting points of quantitative and qualitative approaches to pedagogic research and how this connects to ontology. And don't worry if those words are not familiar to you. When I began my journey into pedagogic research, they were not familiar to me either. Finally, um, some of this slide material uh, owes great thanks to Dr. Arwen Radden, the University of Leicester. There's a citation at the end of the presentation. And my colleague, Dr. Melanie Pope. Now, before we go on, I thought it might be quite useful just to talk a little about, bit about what pedagogic research actually is. And I find this diagram very helpful. Um, it's a diagram that you may have seen before and is certainly widely used. Um, this particular adaptation comes from Kern in 2015. Um, so what the diagram shows, if you look at the cross, is a difference between private uh, practice and public facing practice and informal and systematic approaches to your pedagogy. So in the bottom left hand corner, we have the informal and private uh, uh, pedagogic practice, which is the practice of teaching the things that you do as an educator, such as developing lesson plans and changing your practice based on the feedback from learners or the reflections thereof. In the top left hand corner, we have what we call here scholarly teaching. So this is when you use uh, materials from the literature that you've read, um, from attending pedagogic conferences, and you would put that into your practice. So it's slightly more systematic because it's often based on the evidence of others. Moving over to the other side of the, the diagram, the right, and if you look at the bottom right, sharing about teaching. So this is when you start to share some of your teaching practice in a public domain, but it's perhaps more informal in its format. So, you know, for example, teaching uh, tips, you know, things that work for you or sharing your curriculum or your module structures. And finally, in the top right, we have the systematic and public approach, which here is called the scholarship of teaching and learning, um, which is generally the accepted term across the sector opposed to pedagogic research which does include things like meta-analyses and of course the peer-reviewed uh, empirical research. Uh, and in this talk, when I use the phrase pedagogic research, I'm definitely talking about the top right hand box and very much so about the more systematic approaches. So those peer-reviewed articles. Um, so that's what I mean when I say pedagogic research going forwards. So this diagram shows a typical research flow, where it, one end it starts with your research question, and the other end it finishes off with identifying the appropriate methods to investigate it. A pedagogic research flow, or social sciences research flow, has two other boxes in the middle, which are identify your position as a researcher and identify your methodological position. Now, certainly when I began my pedagogic research, I would jump straight from the research question to the methods. OK, I've got this interesting problem, this intervention in the class. What methods can I use to assess whether it's had an impact on X? Uh, and I'd ignore those middle steps. When I say it, ignore those middle steps, it probably turns out that I had not been ignoring them, but I just wasn't aware of what my positions were. In other words, I've been doing it implicitly all the way along, as probably you have been if you're not aware of your positions are. But I've come to understand that my position, my personal position as a researcher, and therefore my methodological position, is actually really, really important in helping me address my research questions successfully. 
and I feel now that greater exploration of positions of research and methodological has improved my pedagogic research. So where does your position come from? So I think there are several key items um, that are important in the construction of pedagogic research and helping you frame your position. Now, the first of these is the box I've highlighted in purple, which is your methods. So these are obviously the techniques and procedures, uh, and we will talk about those briefly towards the end of this talk, though it's probably the part that you're most familiar with, certainly in in the sense of the methods that you currently use within your discipline or field. I suspect you're also very familiar with the concept of methodology, though it's quite an interesting thought experiment to think carefully about what the difference between the methods and the methodology actually are. So for me, methodology is the strategy or the plan um, or the design that links your choice of methods to your desired outcomes, the kind of overall approach. Then you've kind of got your theoretical perspective, the kind of philosophical stance that informs your methodology, which provides sort of that overall context for its criteria and its, um, you know, provides logic to the approach that you've chosen to employ. Then you've got these two new words, epistemology and ontology, um, which we'll talk about uh, in a little bit but what these are is our overall theory of knowledge and how we review reality because this underpins our theoretical perspective and then this in turn underpins the methodology and leads to the choice of methods so i think the first three boxes that you can see on this diagram actually really do help you determine your position as a researcher which informs your position methodologically. Methodologically. So, what next, or what comes first? I mean, as I've already said, when I began my pedagogic research journey, I, I, I guess I started with the methods, then worked backwards. You know, work, work backwards to the methodology, and, and then to my ontology and epistemology. Um, and I guess there could be an argument for each, but actually now. Um, I consider my position or the position of my co-researchers first and let that inform the methodology and the methods to address the research question. So what is knowledge? So we need to understand what knowledge is because knowledge helps frame our position. It's quite an interesting question to think about what do we actually mean by knowledge? I mean, dictionaries define it roughly as you know facts or informations and skills which are acquired through either education or experience or others would say it's something along the lines of the theoretical or practical uh, understanding of, of a subject so whatever your definition of knowledge i'm sure it includes some of those elements um and after all i think most of us would agree no matter what our research discipline is that you know, the aim of research is to gain new knowledge of some capacity. When we talk about knowledge, um, it's useful to consider two different types of knowledge, um, whether that knowledge is objective or that knowledge is subjective. So objective knowledge is information that is factually based on observation or, or, or measurement. Um, so knowledge that is, exists independently of, you know, social actors or our minds and our experiences. So though you may disagree with some of these um, uh, based on lived experience, things like job appraisals, assessments, scientific studies, which very much applies to our discipline, um, the decisions that juries make in a, in a case for example whereas subjective knowledge is information that's based on personal opinion or judgment or feelings or points of view 
um, as in things that are not directly captured or standardized in any way. They're based on our life experiences and how we, you know, interpret them. So things like taste in art or um, personal opinion on the government or, you know, views about individuals or causes. So there's two different types of knowledge. And the word knowledge is really important when we consider ontology and epistemology. So why does that knowledge that we've just defined actually matter? Well, it could be argued, well, at least I'm arguing now, that the choices we make in any research project are the essence of our research philosophy, because all the ideas that we have are based on our values. Now, whether they're explicit or something held deeply that we're not even actually really aware of, um, you know, they are shaping what we do. And there are two branches of philosophy that talk to knowledge and help us understand what our position is. So ontology, no matter where you read, you know, um, a definition for it is, talks about it being the study of being or understanding the nature of reality um, and it being a system of belief and interpretation of what actually constitutes knowledge you know where does that come from so ontology really refers to the nature of our beliefs and views that we hold about a specific body of knowledge whereas epistemology is more about the procedures used to investigate that problem or undercover that knowledge. So epistemology normally refers to scientific procedures like tools and processes used to investigate problems, whether through that's through like empirical kind of grounded in data approaches or logical or even philosophical or conceptual research. So ontology and epistemology help us understand the language of knowledge which drives our research position. So what does this actually mean? You know, when we're talking about these words, ontology and epistemology, what does it actually mean? Well, there are many different ways to explain um, how we come to know something and how we understand knowledge. In fact, there's actually lots of different ways of explaining ontology and epistemology, which is a real challenge for those new to pedagogic research. Uh, and certainly was and still is a challenge to me. Um, but I find this diagram, which I've already illustrated in an abbreviated form to you from Grix in 2002, as quite an accessible foundation to how ontology and epistemology can help sh shape um, your views of knowledge. So what um, Grix does here is suggests there's an interdependence or a direct relationship between ontology, epistemology, and ultimately your methodology and methods. Um, so he, he sort of suggests that ontology is foundational to your epistemology, which in therefore directly influence your methodology and methods. Or in other words, our values and how we see the world are absolutely essential into how we understand knowledge and how we go about producing it. And I think these short questions or statements underneath each of the boxes help frame that quite clearly. So your ontology is about what what's out there to know. You know, how do, how do we view knowledge? And then epistemology is really what and how can we know about it? What can we do before we can think about our methodologies? How can we actually go about acquiring that knowledge before finally narrowing down and thinking about what price, precise procedures can we use to acquire it? Another way of learning about ontology and epistemology is to claim a research paradigm. Um, so by starting with a research paradigm, as well as being um, perhaps an easier starting point, it does allow you to look back and reflect and adapt your ontological and epistemological position if necessary. I find that the difference in ontology and epistemology um, is not just down to semantics. 
it's actually entirely possible to find definitions of both of these terms which are actually the same or using the same words which I found and still find very confusing whereas a research paradigm is a much more accessible starting point to consider how and why knowledge might be constructed and how we use that as such. I find a paradigm particularly useful in research carried out by um, teams, which is most of my research now. The idea of negotiating, you know, an ontological and epistemological position amongst a team seems not only problematic, but also quite ludicrous. But considering your research paradigm is actually quite useful. I mean, of course, I mean, let's not get too far away from the truth that is that, you know, the primary focus always has to be on the research quest question and a paradigm might actually not be possible. But I can say that including multiple paradigms or at least flexibility around which paradigm you might use does allow for a better approach to answering the question. So two paradigms I'm going to discuss to discuss uh, going forward are positivism and interpretivism, which you can see on the right hand side here, which I want you to acknowledge that there are other paradigms such as critical realism, critical theory and pragmatism, um, uh, which I'm not going to explore, though the, uh, you know, the, the reference at the end does include, include a book which includes more details on these. Uh, and, you know, I'm no philosopher. You know, there are sub paradigms, you know, you know, you know un under critical theory, you include include things like you know, critical race theory and feminism and such like, which give in very specific positions. I'm not an knowledgeable or an expert in any of these, but just didn't want to leave you with the impression that there's um, only a few paradigm positions that with which we can adopt. So let's talk about positivism. So this is something that probably resonates um, very much with scientists uh, who are watching this talk, because the natural science is really a, you know, a model for positivism. So it's really based on, you know, a quest for objective knowledge. That there is uh, a single reality or truth uh, and that we can measure it. So if we have the right tools or instruments, which we may not at the moment, that we can actually measure measure that. Um, so it's often a deductive or a theory testing approach. Um, and it's certainly underpinned by a very much an objectivist ontology. So the idea that facts are facts. Um, you know, and its epistemology is that there's testable theories of knowledge. Um, so it's about explaining how and why things happen. So, you know, measurement, correlation, statistical logic, verification. And its typical, typical methods are surveys, questionnaires, experiments, random sampling, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, you know, I guess positivism, an example hypothesis would be X leads to Y. So, you know, something causes something, you know, or something influences something, you know, X, a relationship between X and Y. Whereas interpretivism is, um, well, it arises from a critique of using the natural sciences as a model in social sciences. And this is more about the quest for subjective knowledge that, so that, you know, you know, the experience is subjective and the worlds that we create around ourselves are individual and socially, you know, constructed or reality needs to be interpreted. Um, so, you know, it's an inductive or theory building approach. So it's very much built on a subjectivist ontology. So, you know, people are people, you know, reality is created by the individual themselves. And its epistemology is that knowledge is unique to that individual. So it's about understanding how and why things happen and elucidating meaning from it. Um, 
Um, and I guess typical approaches would be things like ethnographic studies, in-depth interviews and, and broad range of analytical approaches. Um, and a sample hypothesis may be something along the lines of instead of saying, um, as we had with positivism, X causes Y, but said what causes X? You know, so more open. What are the causes of X kind of type of hypothesis? This useful table from Arwell Radden's work cited at the end on the last slide gives a good overview of positivism and interpretism. So positivism is about explaining. Sometimes interpretism is about understanding. I mean, these are obviously very broad generalizations. Whereas positivism is, has a, a natural home often in the natural sciences, whereas interpretism has a home in the social sciences. The differences between them in the sort of stark contrast approach would be, you know, objective and observable facts versus subjective and individual meanings and actions. Realism that facts are facts and the truth can be captured as long as we've got the right methods. And or people are people and the truth is out there, but it's just very complex. Um, you know, and there's universal principles and facts that underpin the very nature of our knowledge or people's interpretations, meanings, motivations and the value of social actors, people and structures and patterns actually govern what knowledge is and how we view knowledge. So two quite different views there. One thing I find quite useful is kind of the methodological continuum. Once again, uh, an adaptation from Radden's work and a few a few other people's. Um, so if you put interpretivist and positivists kind of work on, on kind of some more weighted scale, you know, very crudely you could say that a positivist approach is very much about theory testing and is often naturally akin to kind of quantitative approaches, whether a, an interpretivist is more about theory building and linked to qualitative approaches. Now, I think it's important to say this here now. Sometimes you'd people say that quantitative and qualitative research are two different research paradigms that, you know, positivist is always quantitative and interpretivist is all qualitative. And though the two do have a natural tendency to draw on those two different kind of re methodologies, um, that is not exclusive or true. And it's probably not helpful to think about it in that terms. The numbers on there is it, a very crude approximation of that sample size. So interpretivist, you know, you could, you know, in order to theory build, you know, you could have five really in-depth focus groups or interviews, you know, with some thematic analysis, you know, you know, so a small sample number, where in order theory testing, you could have 500 quantitative, uh, you know, questionnaires. So now, and as you slide from one view to the other, you can see that I've tried to indicate that the sample size may adjust or modify because of that. My kind of final slide on these two particular uh, approaches is to consider perhaps some of the kind of pros and cons of each um, research paradigm. If it's not a bit crude to do so. Um, so I, mean, I will just read some of these out to make the points clear. Um, so in terms of advantage to positivism, so. It's great because you get large amounts of data. Um, you've got a real clear focus. You know, you're testing a specific fact from the start of the research. Um, some feel there's a good opportunity for to bring control of the research process. You know, you're measuring something specific rather than relying on social actors. And often the data is easily comparable, you know, not just with yours, your, not just in context of your experiment, but with previous data. Of course, um, the problems with this is is often quite inflexible. Once you started the data collection, you know there's little room for movement. It's very much ign ignoring is the wrong word. It's, you know when you're thinking about facts as facts, it, it's weak at comprehending the social processes that garner those facts, and therefore doesn't discover the meanings that people attach to the you know the social phenomena, the facts that you are measuring in this case. 
whereas interpretivism facilitates our understanding of the how and why um, and allows us to adapt to the changes which occur and therefore is really good at understanding social processes well you know that parallel based on the skill of the researcher as well as i suppose and it allows for lots of complexity and contextual factors um the problems with interpretism and i can speak to this very much uh, firsthand as moving into this kind of paradigm quite often is the data collection is time consuming but more so the data analysis is very challenging and complex and open to um um well i guess uncertainty because you know you you never quite sh you want to be sure that your interpretation is representative of the social actors that you're dealing with um and you know try to find whether there are clear patterns that may actually emerge within the work um one other criticism which i had to put in here is that generally um that interpretivism approaches uh, are perceived as less credible by non-researchers and actually i'm going to be even more blunt it's perceived as less credible by people who use a positivism approach um uh, and maybe even some watching this talk and i couldn't agree with the disagree agree disagree got that wrong i mean i completely disagree that it's less credible you know they're just different instruments and they're both as rich as each other uh, and i think working together you get the best answers to your research question so now after we've considered our research paradigm we now can start thinking about our methodology or you know our you know and, and then our research methods and um um i thought i'd say a word on these so I mean, what are they? They're tools for capturing the data. You know, they, they clearly must fit, fit, fit the research question and not your current skill set. So that's actually really, really important in terms of pedagogic research, in my opinion. Um, and a mistake perhaps we all make is that, you know, if you're a squil skilled quantitative researcher and you're moving into pedagogic research, they may not be the best research tools for your particular question. And just because you're most comfortable with them doesn't mean that you should use them. You know, you should think about other tools and bring in collaborators who are experts in those tools if needed. Um, but I'm not going to talk particularly about quantitative, qualitative and mixed methods ap approaches because, um, you know, I'm sure you are quite skilled in the, the broad differences between those. Um, but what I'm saying is you should look at the different types of research methods that are available to you once you're aware of your position as a researcher and your methodological position um, and, and then consider that in that context. Um, I mean, I do find that qualitative, re you know, what I find is that mixed methods is often very, very valuable approach in pedagogic research. So this could be that qualitative research is you know, a preliminary, preliminary to quantitative research. So it gives you <clears throat> more robust questionnaires or interview schedules. All qualitative research is after the quantitative research and it can give you greater insight and illuminate, you know, um, the results and give them more context. Um, for those who are particularly interested, um, Leach and, and Onward Bazizi in 2009 provided a really nice conceptual framework for mixed methods research. Um, and they look at it in terms of three dimensions, the level of mixing. Um, so, you know, are quantitative and qualitative separate or do they overlap? The time orientation. So how much time of your research project is given to each of quantitative and qualitative and the emphasis which one has the greater emphasis in the terms that you answer your specific research question which is a really thorough account of the methods of data collection you know every question asked and the analysis steps so that the study or at least its data coding you know could be replicated by somebody else the second is triangulation so looking for patterns are um or convergent views from different subgroups or different methods of investigation so you know 
does the same conclusion arise if you look at things from different groups of people or use two different qualitative approaches? Um, so abduction, sometimes in the literature, this is called um, deviant case analysis. So in this approach, it's about looking for inconsistencies or contradictions in the data and trying to explain them and they provide a kind of truer account. So not ignoring those. Um, reflexivity, well, reflexivity is actually two types, which is both personal and epistemological. So personal is um, kind of the researchers awareness of how their own background and values and beliefs uh, and relationships with the participants may actually of influence the research. Um, and epistemological is your own awareness of how the research has changed, you know, the concept, their conceptions of knowledge. Um, and, you know, when you read some papers, um, the researchers do include a report of their reflexivity in, in their accounts. So the readers of the paper are aware of the perspective of the researchers when, analog, you know, viewing their findings and how they've interpreted them. And finally, respondent validation. So this is actually really useful for improving the reliability of data collection. Um, so in some circumstances, participants could be invited to check summaries or field notes, um, you know, transcripts to make sure that there's no misconceptions or errors in the um, data so that we've got a true record. Uh, so it's quite interesting because sometimes things like ums and ers, which are included in um, transcripts, you know, which could be interpreted as pauses and things are actually rejected by the participants, even though they were accurately recorded in interviews. So what next? So this talk tried to can help us consider our own position, our own position in terms of our theoretical perspective of knowledge through our epistemology and ontology, and how this shapes our methodology. And we considered research paradigms as a good frame for our own position. We then had a little look at methods and the approaches both quantitative qualitative and then a mixed approach that could be used once we are fully aware of our position so i feel in moving pedagogic research forward you need to move to a position where you understand or consider your position once you're aware of your research question and use that to frame and guide your methodological design and your methods. We'd love to hear your feedback. And the references. So rather than include an incredibly long list of references, and there are many, I've included three different things here. First of all, um, what I consider the best book I've read on this subject, Daniel and Harlan's Higher Education Research Methodology. Uh, secondly, an online guide by Gove and Overton, which has got chapters on um, all sorts of different things, um, including one on getting started in quantitative research and getting started, started in qualitative research. And many of those tips that I uh, produced on the last slide have come directly from there. I use these quite a lot. They're, they're very useful starting points. And finally, just a reference to Radon's slides, which I've mentioned several times and used some of the tables and ideas that they presented in, in, in their work. Thank you.